You know, when we met six or seven years ago on Scientific American Frontiers, we were at MIT and you were playing an electronic violin as an experiment, which is so different from what you're playing tonight. Well, that's <laughs> that's true. I was working with with the students at MIT for yeah. a few years there, and yeah, we met there, and uh, yeah, that was a fun project doing that and working on new instruments for kids and and new electronic instruments. But there's still nothing that compares to a uh, Stradivarius, of course. What is there? What if you play on a lesser instrument, a, a lesser violin? Is it that you can't get the same nuances? You can't express yourself the same way. What what is it? Well, it's uh, this. This was a Stradivarius made in 1713, by the way, um, the ex Hubermann Strad, and it's um, there's something about there's a magical quality about about a great Italian instrument like a Strad or a Guarneri. Um, it's it's hard to describe, but there it's the nuance, the subtlety one can get with with the bow, and and it's like colors of sound. It's, mm, it's a, mm. I, I think of it like an artist having more a bit wider palette of colors, you know, to create something with. And um, once you play in a strat, it's very hard to to go back to anything else. It's, this has a, a hi an interesting history, doesn't it? This, this does. particular fiddle. Uh, well, first of all, any Stradivarius is something incredible, and uh, this one is uh, this was played by a great violinist called Hubermann, uh, Branislav Hubermann, uh, in the early part of the, the 20th century. And it's very famous for the fact that it was stolen from Hubermann uh, just uh, down the street from here at uh, Carnegie Hall. Uh, he was playing a concert uh, at Carnegie Hall, uh, playing the Franck Sonata on, an, on his other, on his Guarneri del Gesù. He left the Strad uh, backstage in his dressing room and he came back and it was gone. And he never saw the violin again. It disappeared for 50 years. 50 yeah, years. Yeah. How, how did it turn up again? Well, turned up um, when the thief, all grown up and, and on his Tried deathbed. Tried to play a concert. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did all his life. It turns out the thief stole it for himself. Uh, to play. That's why it was never discovered, because if he tried to sell it, they yeah, would know sure, right away. Sure. So he uh, he played it for years in cafes and various gigs in New York. He, he played what gypsy music on the Stradivarius. Yeah, yeah and in fact, great. people well, used to ask him, what, what's that violin? It sounds great. And he would say, oh, it's a Stradivarius, and nobody would believe it. <laughs> right. But, so uh, on his deathbed, he confessed? <laughs> on his deathbed, apparently, this is the, the story um, that I'm told, uh, he confessed to his wife, um, who, who then uh, claimed it to the insurance company and actually she collected a, a fee actually somehow oh. I don't know how that, how that worked out but uh, it, uh, it it finally went back to uh, to actually the insurance company who had paid out 50 years earlier and then it went on to Norbert Brain and the great violinist from the Amadeus Quartet oh. and then I bought it from him about nine or eight or nine years ago so well, how, how great that you're that's that a you're privilege to play now, on something yeah. like this when, you know when I when I work in my field, Whenever I do a play, if I do the same play each night, I'm hoping that it'll be different mm -hmm. each night. Do you look forward to a difference in your performance, or do you want it to be as th that same kind of great that it was last time you did it? Well, you know, I think there are a lot of similarities between acting in a play, um, similar to, to playing music like this. Generally, I think you have an idea of what you want to do philosophically about the piece or about the play, but then there's room for uh, for improvisation in a way, mm -hmm. um, not so much making up new notes, but but room for, for uh, each night to be a little different. And, and yeah. not only that, when you go back to the practice room, every time I go to the Mendelssohn Concerto, which I'm about to, to play, um, just you keep looking for things, and there's 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 always more. A great piece like Mendelssohn, and I suppose it makes a difference if it's a, something like Shakespeare or some great play. It's always going to inspire you to look for new things. So it's so I really I don't remember ever feeling tired of the Mendelssohn Concerto, mm. for instance, if, even though I played it uh, probably a thousand times at least. It, it, that that opening theme is so beautiful. That that melody is so haunting. Is it a problem playing a piece that's so well known that you feel that you have to? You have to give a fresh slant on it. I mean, you know, I heard about a guy who saw Hamlet once and said, I don't like that play. There are too many quotes in it. Too many quotes. That's a good, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. I mean, do you uh, have that problem with a piece well, of music there's, like this? Actually, there's a danger of worrying about that too much and, and trying to be different, I think, uh, just for the sake of being yeah, different. Yeah, and then it yeah. can be contrived and not honest. So I really think if you if you look at the piece in your own personal and honest way, it's going to be different from anyone else's. So how does that apply to it being different each yeah. night? Uh, do, do you do you deliberately make it different in places, or do you discover a difference that's occurring? You know, it's there's something about the magic of the moment, also the interplay between the instruments. I mean, there's a lot of give and take, yeah. and, and ways to take time, more time here, more time there, bring out different parts of the phrase one time, uh, the, um, and and uh, 
there's just room for that, and I suppose like like in a play, but and also in the Mendelssohn concerto. By the way, I wrote my own cadenza for it, which is something I added years. You know, I have to tell you, I, I passed by your dressing room tonight before the concert, and I heard you going over the cadenza. Yes. For the for the Mendelssohn. Trying it to was, remember what I wrote. <laughs> yes. It was really. You, 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 now, did you write it? Did you actually write it? Did you? Well, just, I, did you I find didn't write it, it down, but I did compose. I'm not improvising it on the spot. No, uh, no. But um, did you it, did you improvise it ever in practice? In practice, that's sort of how I started writing a cadenza. And then eventually I came up with something which is changes uh, as from from uh, year to year. But uh, it's something different for the Mendelssohn because Mendelssohn wrote his own cadenza. So it's a little bit daring for me to uh, remove well, Mendelssohn. Yes, here you are. I, you are I, collaborating I'm probably with in trouble with some people for, for that. <laughs> but but it, it sounds so beautiful. And you bring in that melody. You have echoes of the opening. Well, that's melody. the cadenza is really a, a personal. Uh, take on what's going on in the piece. It's, it's the moment where the soloist plays by by himself and and improvises on on the themes and, and in their in his personal way. And I, I don't. I hope Mendelssohn wouldn't have uh, isn't turning over in his grave. Does the, does the composer give the soloist guideposts, uh, or is is it always written by the composer? Sometimes is it just left open with well, the, with some guideposts of the number the, of bars you're going to. Well, play the cadenza is generally in in pieces like Beethoven or Brahms. There's just a a chord that the orchestra finishes, and then you you play until and then the, uh, until the orchestra comes back in, and you can do pretty much whatever you want. And there, but some people take it to great extremes um, uh, in modern times and play crazy things. And uh, it's really um, there are a lot of ways to think of a cadenza. Some are long, some are short, but um, it's it's a fun part. So in in the old days, everyone wrote their own, and it was something yeah, that was the audience would look forward to hearing the the artist his his cadenza. You start out from the chord. That, that you that you last hear the orchestra play, and then you have to come in. Yes, so you have that to, they can especially in the right? Mendelssohn is particularly hard because the way he wove his own cadenza into the piece it was it was unlike other concerti at the at the time. So it was more challenging for me to write something that came out of what he wrote and then came back into what he wrote. Um, that was actually the fun part was finding a way to do that. And you did the cadenzas for uh, the cadenzas for the uh, for, for Mozart. Uh, sure, for the pieces that we just played, little those little things. Those were small ones, but uh, but uh, yeah. Well, you know, there have been times on the stage when I couldn't quite remember how the line, the next line went, and I've collaborated with some of the greatest playwrights. The way right. you collaborated with Mozart and Mendelssohn, only I tried to make it look like they meant it that way, and I guess you do too. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, but they, I mean, exactly. it, it's it's uh, it's seamless that uh, the the way you do it. It's just beautiful. Oh, thank you, thank you. The this this amazes me. You, I saw you on YouTube, uh oh, playing in the subway. Oh no, uh, yes. I mean, I love it that you have well, this that willingness was, to, to to experiment. It like was this. an experiment that I was asked as a favor by by Gene Weingarten from the Washington Post, who wanted to write an article about music in context, and. Um, Asked if I would just play in the subway for a while, and he would interview people, see how what the effect would be. <laughs> yeah. and, and they didn't uh, know it was you. Well, no, it had nothing to do with whether they would recognize but you me were personally. Bach, but Bach, and Bach, you know, great music on the great violin, and, yeah. and but it was during rush hour, and it was it it seemed to captures the imagination of, of, of the public Bach. more than I had expected, so well, I, I well, haven't heard the, the end of it. <laughs> among the people who passed by, it captured about a dozen people, I think. Well, but, some some stopped, some yeah, about yeah. thirty maybe, but. On YouTube, uh, over a million and a half, so it hasn't it hasn't gone to waste. <laughs> you, what, I, this I can't get over. How varied your life has been. You you were a, a nationally ranked tennis player when you were a kid, right? How old well, I, I I was competitive tennis player as a, from a ten to age ten to twelve something. Like that. I played a lot of sports as a kid. I grew up in Indiana. Uh, on a farm and was, you know, had a sort of normal childhood, played a lot of sports. Did your violin teacher know this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, that, was anybody worried about your boy? Oh, always, you? always, yeah. And my first recital I ever played, my first big recital, I was out throwing a boomerang and it came back and hit me in the, in the head and I had stitch. I was in the hospital oh, right God. up to my... Oh, sorry to, to hear that. You know, but my, my parents were, you know, they let me be a kid and so that was, that was, uh, that was important. When was me. the first time you played on a great violin like this? My Can first time, yes, I do, because my teacher, Joseph Gingold, who was one of the great pedagogues, I went to him at the age of 12 and he had a Stradivarius. He had an early Strad, the sweetest sounding, I mean, I still can hear it in, in, my, in my ear, and he would occasionally during the lessons, he would say, "Come on, play, play oh, a few notes." You know, and, and how it would old be. Were you at that I point? was twelve. You oh know, and this God. first time, it was just opened up a whole world of, of sound and imagination, and and uh, so so I now I have my own. So it's, it's it is um, I have special memories of that first my first strad. 
do you, it's, it's an interesting thing tonight. You, you talk about playing your first Strad when you were 12. You share something with, with Mozart and Mendelssohn in that all three of you were prodigies. Oh, come on. I'm not going to put myself in the same well, sentence as those in, two. In terms of but, you, you but, reaching the, the attention of serious concert goers well, at a okay. very early age. There's a prodigy and then there's uh, Mendelssohn okay, and Mozart. Okay, all right. um, and they were, they, they were, Mendelssohn and Mozart were probably the greatest prodigies. In fact, I would almost venture to say Mendelssohn was even a greater prodigy in some ways, as far as the, now, why is the depth of what he wrote at an early oh, age. Oh, what he was able to do I early. Mean, Mozart wrote amazing things at an, early, at an early age, and they got better and better. And Mendelssohn wrote the, Mendel the, the of course he wrote the Mendelssohn Octet. Uh, <laughs> who else is going to write it? Uh, he, he wrote that at the age of 16, uh, and it's probably the, maybe one of the greatest pieces in all of the repertoire of any piece it's of music and, and he was 16 when he wrote it and it's fully yeah. formed the depth is incredible and the violin concerto is often called the perfect violin concerto it's it's just uh, among the greatest pieces uh, really ever and and sometimes Mendelssohn isn't given the same sort of uh, credit in a way as, as someone like Mozart or Beethoven but I think Mendelssohn deserves to be on his, on his uh, birthday year here um, you're, and you're about to, to play in a few minutes you'll oh, play yeah, I yeah, yeah. what's the <laughs> What is there a little moment you're looking forward to when you think to yourself in in, in that concerto? I'm I'm in heaven now. Now like I'm just floating. When it's over, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I'm finally done, and I can go. Oh, I can't go wait relax. to hear from beginning to end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank nice you to so see much. you again. Thank you.